Amen. I'm going to start in Romans chapter 4 tonight. Romans chapter 4 gives us the example of Abraham's faith. He's the father of our faith, the scripture tells us. And it gives us a pattern whereby we can follow and exercise faith the same way he did to become the father of many nations. And that principle of faith, that operation of faith that's defined here in Romans chapter 4 will work for us for whatever we're believing for. Starting in verse 17, speaking of God and his dealings with Abraham, it says, As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's a difficult uh, uh, verse for the translators. It literally means that before Abraham had any children, after he was too old to have children, from the natural standpoint, after his and Sarah's body uh, bodies had stopped functioning in a reproductive manner, God appeared to Abraham and said, I have made thee the father of many nations. Now it's important to recognize that God said it was something that was already done. God always deals with and speaks in the past tense. That means everything that Jesus affected for us, everything that he purchased through his blood, through his death, burial, and resurrection, we should look at in the past tense because it was the sacrifice of Jesus that made all these things available to us. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 says, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. Now Isaiah says we are healed because he's looking forward to the future, the sacrifice that Jesus would make in the future. Peter, quoting Isaiah 53, 5, says by whose stripes we were healed. So when we take the word of God, we need to realize that there aren't a lot of promises to us. There's a lot of information about what God has done. But if we look at everything as a promise, then we're going to be looking for God to do something to affect that promise in our lives. And the reality is, Jesus has already done the work. He's paid the price necessary. He's done everything that was required to provide for us redemption from spiritual death, poverty, and, and sickness. So here where it says, talking about Abraham, notice the phrase, before him whom he believed. That word before is the word like. So it really says, like unto him who be believed. Verse 17 is telling us that Abraham's principle of faith was to be an imitator of God. Now the two things that the Bible specifically tells us about Abraham's imitation of God and the principle of faith that we should follow is that he calls things that be not as though they were. God did that when he called Abraham the father of many nations. When he said, I have made thee the father of many nations. But the other part was difficult. And that is, Abraham was like unto God in this respect also, in the quickening of the dead. Now how can, we know that man doesn't have the power in and of himself to raise the dead, and that's usually what we talk about or think about when we talk about um, uh, God quickening the dead. But it really gives us a two-sentence summary of God's job description. He makes dead things alive, and he calls things that be not as though they were. So here where it says that Abraham was like unto God. In other words, he was an imitator of God in this respect. It simply means that he spoke life to his own body. He called things that be not as though they were. He agreed with God that God had made him the father of many nations, and he spoke life unto his body. Now, I don't know exactly what form that took. It may have been fulfilled, and the Holy Ghost may, have, may be telling us that that was fulfilled by Abraham accepting his name changed from Abram to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. Or there may have been some other way that he affected that too. That part we don't know. But we do know that God counted him as being an imitator of God. And, and children should be imitators of their fathers. The devil's children certainly act like the devil. So God's children should act like God. And so that's the point that this is bringing out. Like unto him... Whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. In other words, he didn't have any physical circumstances to look at and have any hope for. His body was completely dead reproductively. Sarah's body was completely dead reproductively. He had no natural circumstance to look at and put any hope in whatsoever. 
his circumstance identified his situation as hopeless except for God. So against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. It tells us that Abraham had something else that he looked at rather than his body. Since his body was dead reproductively, since Sarah's body was dead reproductively, he had to have something else to look at. And what he chose to look at was the promise of God. The promise of God was that as he showed him the stars in the sky and asked him to number them, Abraham said it's impossible to number the stars that God had created. And then God said, so shall your seed be. That's the promise that he looked at. That's what he kept before his eyes. That's what kept him from staggering at the promise of God. That's what kept him steady. I'm sure the devil tried every way that he could against Abraham, just like he tries every way he can against us, to get him to look at the circumstances, to get him to check his body to see if anything had changed from yesterday, and so forth, just the same way the devil works against us. But Abraham maintained a strong faith by looking under the promise of God, and that was the only thing that he looked at. He resisted the temptation to waver, to think and or believe and or speak anything to the contrary of what God said. And instead, he chose to be strong in faith. Now, of all the things that the Bible tells us about Abraham's faith and the characteristics, it gives us two more characteristics, two final characteristics of what strong faith is and what it looks like. Notice again, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Two characteristics of this strong faith is that he was fully persuaded, or he became fully persuaded, within a year's time. A year prior to Isaac being born, Abraham was laughing at the promise of God because he thought that God had, had uh, let him down in that regard. He looked at the condition and the situation with his body and Sarah's bodies, again reproductively. And he laughed at the promise of God. But somewhere in the next year, nine months to a year, Abraham came to the place where he was strong in faith and fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able also to perform. So the first characteristic it tells us about strong faith is that he was fully persuaded about God's ability to bring his word to pass. The second characteristic is a little simpler, but it's not always held to. And that is, he glorified God for the answer before he saw it. Where he was giving glory to God, that simply means that he was praising God for the answer before he ever saw the answer come into being. Now, folks, that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes tonight about thanking God for your answer. Turn back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. This is one of my favorite parts of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, because it tells you how God expects for us to pray and shows us the answer when we pray the way God says according to the pattern that was established for us verse 1 it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle then there came some that told Jehoshaphat saying there comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria and behold they be in a uh, Someplace, I don't know how to say the name, which is in Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Now, the kingdoms, the Old Testament kingdoms, have divided by this point. There's uh, ten and a half tribes that go with the northern kingdom that was known as Israel, and then there's a tribe and a half that stays uh, in the south that was known as Judah. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah, and he's being surrounded. And there's uh, five enemy armies that are coming to attack, planning to attack Judah. Certainly a force, a military force that's greater than anything that he has access to. So he feared and set himself to see the Lord, seek the Lord, and proclaim to fast throughout all Judah. He looked first to God. Before he did anything else, he knew God was his only answer. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. 
Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Now, keep that in mind, folks. They're coming together to ask help of the Lord. Here's what a cry for help looks like as far as God is concerned. Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord and before the new court and said, Here, this is the beginning of the prayer. I love this prayer. He said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people Israel and gave it to thy seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil comes upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. In other words, everything you said up to this point is kind of a, a pro prologue to identify the power of God and put God in remembrance of his word. They're literally, literally saying, God, didn't you tell us that when we run into this kind of trouble, you'd hear us and help us? Did you not say that if we'd come and pray before this place or in this place, that you would enable us to have your assistance to keep us from being overrun or being destroyed by these enemy armies? Folks, I want you to realize this is not a prayer of desperation. They're in a desperate situation. But strong faith doesn't pray desperate prayers. Jehoshaphat is not praying a desperate prayer. Now he knows that without the help of God, they're sunk. There's no way they can gain a military victory in this situation outside of God and his help. But it's almost a challenge. Jehoshaphat is challenging God. Now remember in the Old Testament as well, in Isaiah God spoke to Israel and said, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together, declare thou thy cause. God wants us to be so aware of what he has said in his word and trusting in what he has said in his word to such a degree that it sounds like a challenge. And folks, God loves to be challenged by his word. Uh, it makes me think of the time where Jesus was walking on the water and coming to where the disciples were in the boat, and they saw him on the water and, and thought this was too much to accept or to believe that it could be Jesus, that Peter challenged Jesus to challenge him. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come out on the water. And Jesus said, come. God never shies away from a challenge. And when the challenge is based on the scripture or the promise that he's already made to his people, that delights God. Now, folks, I, I got to tell you, a lot of people will never be willing to pray this kind of prayer because they have so ingrained in their minds wrong thoughts as to the effect or something to the effect that God would be offended if we approached him and talked to him that way. But Jehoshaphat's not accusing God of anything. He's simply reminding him of what he said in his word. He's simply reminding God of the promise that God made unto the people of Israel when they dedicated the temple. Lord, didn't you say that when we come before you in trouble, you'll help us? When I was going to re remind God or tell God what the situation is, like God doesn't know. Verse 10, And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. A couple of things you need to be aware of. Jehoshaphat is saying the only reason these people haven't been defeated already is because you wouldn't let Israel attack them. When Israel came into the promised land, you told them to leave those people alone. And that's the only reason that they're still around. And now, Lord, look how they come to, to reward us for leaving them alone and letting them live in the first place. Look at the way they reward us by coming against us to overrun us and overcome us. The second thing I want you to see about this is in verse 11. Behold, I say how they reward us to come cast us out of thy possession. Jehoshaphat knows that the kingdom of Judah belongs to God. They may be the, the earthly physical stewards of it, 
But they know that it's a possession that God said was theirs even while they were still in Egypt. Behold, Lord, how they come to reward us, to come to cast us out of your possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. Verse 12, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Now, folks, most people would pray, we don't know what to do, and then start crying. That's not what Jehoshaphat does. Jehoshaphat says they're stronger than us. We don't have any might in and of ourselves. We don't even know what to do in this situation. But our eyes are on you. Our eyes are not on them. Our eyes are not on their strength. Our eyes are not on what they have threatened to do by the assembling of their armies together. Our eyes are upon you. Folks, this is exactly what Abraham did. Abraham kept his eyes on God and God's promise. When the physical circumstances, everything about his physical circumstances said it cannot be. When everything in his life, everything in his, that's going on in, in between him and Sarah says, no, 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 it cannot be. It's impossible. Abraham, without any natural hope, gained hope from the promise of God and he kept his eyes fixed on that. That's exactly what Jehoshaphat's saying here. Our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. For tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Now, the Bible tells us that the children of Israel accepted that word of the Lord. But but before we read any further, I want to bring out a couple of points. Consider how important it would be, and it was, for Israel to know that they could trust the guy that was speaking for God. It fascinates me that Israel accepted what this guy said was from the Spirit of the Lord. We don't know anything about who this guy is. We don't know anything of him. He's not even mentioned anywhere else in the Bible except for this place. But the children of Israel, some way or another, whether it was through knowledge that they had of him or or something else that I don't even know, how to consider they trusted what he said God spoke so clearly to his people I'm not just talking about in this instance I'm talking about prior to this instance where the people of Israel had no doubt they had no resistance there didn't seem to be any questions where are all the unbelieving Jews to raise the the point or raise the question, how do we know this guy really spoke by the Spirit of God? When I compare the ten spies in Numbers chapter 13 at the edge of the promised land, the ones that went to spy out the land, when I compare their report of unbelief back to the congregation of Israel, compare him to this guy, this seems like a different people. Some way or another, God made himself known. And everybody accepted it. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. It doesn't seem to give us any indication whatsoever that there were those that resisted or those that doubted. This was something that happened. And it didn't happen in at least the description of it isn't such that it would be a a real spectacular operation of God. 
Spirit of God moved on somebody and he told what God said to him. So speaking through him, God communicated with the people and they accepted it readily. I wish the church was more like that. I wish the voice of the Lord was so clear and so distinct in the modern day church that we would know that we know that we know when God speaks. Nowadays it seems like so many people, so many Christians are willing just to follow whatever somebody says is the Lord without any judgment on their own part. And as a result, a lot of people get pulled astray. So Jehoshaphat and all the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord and the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Folks, everybody is thrilled. Everybody is happy. Everybody's encouraged. They were encouraged when they heard the voice of the Lord. But then the next morning comes around. How many times have we been fired up on Sunday from the word of God blessing our hearts. Then Monday comes around we forget what we were encouraged about the day before. So they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth Jehoshaphat stood and said. Hear me O Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God so shall you be established. Believe his prophets so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, that means in front of the army, and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now notice verse 22, and when they began to sing into praise, and when they began to sing into praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. Now, folks, notice again verse 22. When did God set ambushments against the the enemies of Israel? Was it the day before when the prophet spoke by the Spirit of the Lord and said, you'll not need to fight in this battle. The battle is not yours, it's God's. Now everybody's worshiping God the day before, thanking him for his deliverance, thanking him for the words that came through the prophet that would give them hope and encouragement that the battle truly was the Lord's. But when was that promise made good? The promise wasn't made good when it was spoken through the prophet. The promise was made good when the people accepted it and demonstrated their acceptance of it the next day By singing and praising God. See the promise was good. The promise was true. But it wasn't activated until the people started praising God. It tells us that they came upon the people as they were destroyed. And took them several days to carry off the spoil. Total and complete victory. And the victory came as a result of the people of God seeking God's direction first and foremost, accepting what he said, and then praising him for the answer. Remember Abraham's characteristics, the two characteristics of strong faith that Romans 4 tells us. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. Let's look at a New Testament example. Look with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, we'll start reading in verse 16. It came to pass as we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying or fortune telling. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. Now, I don't know how many days is, but it sounds like it's more than just a few This did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, why didn't Paul do this the first day? The Bible says that the name of Jesus is stronger than any evil spirit. 
And one of the works that God gave the church, that Jesus directed the church, was to cast out devils. So why does this little girl do this day after day after day for many days? Again, I don't know how many that is. I don't know whether to consider it a handful. I don't know if it's talking about a week. I don't know if it's talking about two weeks. I don't know how long it's talking about. But it certainly indicates to us that it wasn't the first time that Paul heard it. Where it says Paul was grieved, that seems to indicate that the Holy Ghost finally moved on him to do something about it. That also indicates to us that we don't have the ability to just, to just decide in and of ourselves that we're going to cast the devil out of somebody else. Now, somebody that comes to us for help, certainly we can help them. But this little girl hasn't come for help. This is something that the Holy Ghost initiates on his own, apparently. And Paul cast the devil out of this little girl. Verse 19, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them under the marketplace and under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them, or commanded them to be beaten, in other words. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast him into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, folks, I want to stop reading here for a little bit. We'll pick up the rest of the story in just a moment. But I want you to back up with me to verse 6. It's telling us about Paul's missionary journey and where he went on this missionary journey. Verse 6 tells us that after they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, Asia is the part of the, the, um, the Eastern world that we know of as, uh, well, would be part of Turkey now. But it's a place where um, Colossae was. It was a place where Ephesus was. It was one of the, uh, the mega centers of the world that existed at that time. Now, we know that Paul wound up going to Ephesus. But this is something that when God sent them out on their journey, they didn't know everything that he wanted them to do. He didn't give them an itinerary before they left so that they would know ahead of time where they were going and where the next place they'd go after that was and so forth. They're being led by the Holy Ghost step by step. And so they come to the place where it makes sense to go into Asia. But the Holy Ghost says, don't go there. Sometimes God will make you, lead you into places that make less sense than going somewhere else. Now, why didn't God let him go into Asia at that point in time? I certainly don't have an answer for that. Do you? It would seem that Paul and his company, Paul and Silas, expected that Asia would be the best place to go or the right place to go to reach people and, and establish churches. But God sees things differently than we do. So they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7, after that they were come to Mysia. And they essayed, the word essayed just simply means attempted. They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now here's twice that the Holy Ghost has forbid them from going in a certain direction that they thought would be the best way to go. Proverbs chapter 3 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Now there's nothing wrong with leaning on to your understanding until it comes to the place where it contradicts the word. They're leaning to their understanding. And their understanding is first and foremost we should go next into Asia. But somehow the Holy Ghost forbids them to go. Now I don't know how. The Bible doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us if it was just an inward witness. Or if the Spirit of the Lord came on somebody. It would seem to me that if it, if it was a spectacular move of God with the Holy Ghost coming on somebody that the Bible would give us direction or information about that, but maybe, maybe not. Somehow or another, the Holy Ghost is communicating, I don't want you to go to Asia. And then when they come to Mysia and try to go into Bithynia, the Holy Ghost lets them know that's not where I want you to go either. Now, folks, wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier for the Holy Ghost just to tell them where he wanted them to go? God doesn't always work that way. 
You remember when Samuel went down to Jesse's house at the direction of the Lord to anoint David to be the next king? He goes and he finds Jesse, tells Jesse what, the, or what he's come for. And it strikes fear in Jesse's heart and everybody's nervous about this because if King Saul finds out, he's certainly going to have everybody killed. So after Samuel tells Jesse what he's there for, he starts bringing in his sons from the oldest to the youngest. Well, when the oldest one came in, Samuel said, surely this is the Lord's chosen one. He looks like a king. And the Lord spoke to him and said, he's not the one. And then those precious words that were spoken that we all have heard and remember, he said, God looks on, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And finally, they get to the last one that's at the house. And each time the Lord said, he's not the one, he's not the one, he's not the one. Finally, they look like they're running out of sons. So Samuel asks, is this all your children? And Samuel says, well, I'll accept the, the youngest one. He's out in the field keeping the sheep. And of course, that was David. And when David came in, the Lord spoke to him and said, this is the Lord's anointed one. Now, again, wouldn't it have been a whole lot simpler for the Holy, Holy Ghost just to tell him up front, go down to Jesse's house and anoint his son called David to be the next king? Folks, God very rarely takes you out of a situation where it's important or necessary for you to believe him and follow the inward witness. Very seldom does God do that because he wants us to understand. He wants us to experience. He wants us to live in a way that everything that we do is directed by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says God directs the steps of a, uh, orders the steps of a righteous man. Well, how does he order those steps? One at a time. Step by step by step. So here they get to Mysia. They try to go into Bithynia and somehow or another the Holy Ghost forbids them to go there too. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. Verse 9, And the vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, here's a spectacular leading of God. That's what makes me think, in part at least, that's what makes me think, that if there were other spectacular leadings, visions, or a voice from God or something like that, the Bible would have probably let us know that that took place. And the fact that it doesn't tell us something like that took place, then I'm left to conclude that they were forbidden by the Holy Ghost just by the inward witness. But now think about that again, too. They essayed to go into Bithynia. They tried to go into Bithynia. So it's not like they had a witness of where to go. They kept getting a witness or come to, coming to crossroads, and they had to test God or test the, the leading of the Holy Ghost, identify the leading of the Holy Ghost on every decision that they made at every crossroads they came to. Now, folks, if that's not an example of a spirit-led life, I don't know what is. And God's initiating it to work this way. It's not like Paul and Silas are so dense that it takes God to do something spectacular to get their attention. So now they have a vision, where Paul has a vision. He must have convinced Silas and the others in the company and their traveling companions that the way that this came and the information it provided must mean that this is where God wants us to go. Notice the phrase that says, they went into Macedonia assuredly gathering that that was the plan of the Lord. Again, they've just got an inward witness that the vision was safe to follow. Verse 14, I'm sorry, verse 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathered, gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia in a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. Notice verse 12 tells us where this takes place, where he cast the devil out of this little girl and where they were thrown into prison. It's in the city of Philippi. So let's get back to where we were in the story. 
Verse 23 again, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, folks, this is because they followed a vision and went to the place that they assuredly gathered that God wanted them to go. You'd think if God led you by a supernatural way, by giving you a vision to showing you where to go, you would expect better results than winding up in jail and beaten, wouldn't you? See, a lot of people have the idea that the leading of the Lord means he'll always lead you away from trouble. And he doesn't. The Bible says the first place that God led Jesus after he was anointed by John in the Jordan River, baptized by John in the Jordan River, Holy Ghost came upon him and sat on him in physical form like a bird would fly out of the sky and land on your shoulder. First place Jesus was sent to or led by the Holy Ghost was into the wilderness. God doesn't always take you to pleasant places, but he always takes you to places that we have opportunity to use our faith, determine God's faithfulness, and grow spiritually. It's the hard places in life that we learn to trust God. It's the hard places that we found out, find the true measure of God's faithfulness to his word. Don't ever shy away from a test or a trial. Because if we handle ourselves well and keep our eyes on the Lord, no matter how big the opposition, no matter how serious the problem, we can be just like Jehoshaphat and Judah of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. If we keep our eyes on the Lord and follow his direction, he'll always lead us into victory. Now, folks, being, they're beaten. Their backs are bleeding in the middle of the night. This would be a perfect opportunity, especially for Silas, who's sitting right next to Paul. The rest of Paul's company was not thrown in jail. But Silas would have, have had every opportunity to look over at Paul and say, man, I thought you had a vision about coming here. Did you see this in the vision too? Maybe you'd say something like, that's the last time I'm going to trust you about where we go. This was not a pleasant experience. So how did they handle it? They've been unjustly beaten. They've been mistreated. All because they cast the devil out of a little girl. Little slave girl. What do they do? Verse 25, and at midnight, I believe this literally was midnight, but it could stand for the midnight hour of your troubles or your situations. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Now, folks, get a picture of what's going on here. Paul and Silas, after again being mistreated and beaten for doing good and delivering this little girl from the power of the devil, after the treatment from the magistrates of the city of Philippi. How do they handle this situation? They prayed and sang praises unto God. And notice the fact that the Bible says that the prisoners heard them. That tells me they heard what they prayed. That tells me they heard them singing praises. Now, if you were in Paul and Silas' situation in the middle of the night, what would you be praying for? An extra blanket? What would you be praying for? Man, I'd be praying something like, Lord, this isn't right that we were treated this way for delivering a little girl from the power of the devil. You sent us here. You gave us the vision. Now get us out of here. That would have been my first and foremost concern. How about you? But notice they didn't just pray. They prayed and sang praises unto God. Now what are they praising God about? 
Well, if they're trusting God to hear and answer their prayer, then they're praising God for the answer that they haven't yet seen. That is the principle of faith that we are given to follow. And remember, it's Paul that writes the letter to the Roman church. It's Paul that identifies these principles of faith in Abraham. So he must have known something about it. He knew enough about it to identify, again, by the direction of the Holy Ghost, but to identify these character traits that made Abraham's faith strong and brought about the impossible in his life. So when they sang praises unto God, they've got to be thanking God for the answer. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Now, folks, notice the similarity between 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, set ambushments against the enemies of Israel or Judah. Notice the, the comparison with Acts 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas sang, uh, prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. In both cases, they're thanking God for an answer that they can't yet see. Now, the jailer, he's in an interesting situation. He wakes up, sees the doors open. He assumes everybody is gone. And so he attempts to take his life. But Paul stops him by crying out and saying, we're all here. Why in the world are the prisoners still there? There's only one answer that satisfies me, folks, and that is they heard enough about Paul and Silas's prayer and the praises that they sang to recognize that the doors were open because of what they did. What earthquake just opens prison doors? There's no destruction in the city. It doesn't tell us any other place was shaken except the prison because that's the only place Paul and Silas were when they sang and pray, sang, uh, prayed and sang praises. But where it says the prisoners heard them, they must have heard enough of their prayer and their thanksgiving songs. They're praising God to identify that the prison doors were opened in God's response to what Paul and Silas have done, to what they've prayed. Because nobody moves. Paul went from being somebody that was a criminal in the eyes of the magistrates to run in the prison because of their prayer and their praises to God. Now, folks, remember that we read, I think it's verse 12, that this is in the city of Philippi where all these things take place. Look with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Paul writing back to the church many years later, many years after this first visit into the city, which is identified for us in Acts 16 that we just read. Paul writes back to the church in verse 6, Philippians 4, 6. He says, be careful for nothing. Another translation says, don't worry or have any anxiety about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now, folks, as would be the case in any church, maybe every church, that Paul wrote letters to, much of the Christian church at that point in time was, was under great persecution by the Roman emperors. And so it'd be real easy for people that are in terrible situations, persecuted situations, to respond to something like what Paul said, be careful for nothing. To respond to something like that, to respond to that in, a, in some similar manner as, well, it's easy for you to say, because you're not here and you're not experiencing the things that we are. But Paul has some credibility behind the directions or instructions he gives them. Because he was in their situation in their very town when he was thrown in jail for casting the devil out of that little girl. So when Paul writes back to the church and says, be careful for nothing, don't be anxious or fret about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Notice it's not just prayer. 
It's not just asking God to do something for you. But with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He knows that they know that he's lived this out in front of them. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I wonder how many of us are in the situation where we've prayed, but we haven't sang praises for the answers that we seek. I wonder how many people are looking and identifying or trying to identify what new thing do I need to do to make my prayer come to pass to get the answer I need from God and the only thing that's being left out is the fact that they haven't praised God for the answer. See the Bible puts prayer and praise together in these several places and others as well that we could take the time and look at if we had the time. But the Bible identifies prayer and praise or let me say it this way the Bible identifies the prayer of faith coupled with praise as being a necessary element to see your answer come to pass. Now it seems to me that most Christians are really easy about praying. It's easy for them to pray. They're quick to pray. But somebody said that, that praise is the highest type of faith. Somebody said that the praise is the highest type of prayer because it's Letting God is demonstrating before God and before the devil and before your circumstances, the situations you and I might be in. It's a demonstration that you believe God's word is real and that you believe the answer is come because God heard you when you prayed. That's the pattern that worked, Old Testament and New Testament, and it still works today. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. That formula still works. It worked for Abraham long before these other things took place. Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God, thanking God for the answer before he saw the answer, thanking God for his son being born before Sarah ever became pregnant. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able also to perform. Let me make just a comment about this fully persuaded thing. The more you praise God, the easier it is for you to be fully persuaded. The more you thank God for the answer, the more persuaded you become. The Bible is simply telling us that Abraham praised God enough to get to the place where he had no questions, no doubts. He was fully persuaded that God was able to bring his and Sarah's body back to life reproductively so that his promise of a son would be fulfilled Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God one of the greatest things that we can do to show God we believe his word is to thank him for the answer before we see it amen let's pray father we magnify your holy name we thank you that there's nothing that's impossible with you and according to your word, there's nothing impossible to us as believers. Lord, we've prayed. We've asked you for the things that we desire. We've reached out in faith to take hold of what Jesus purchased for us. So now, Lord, we just take a moment and thank you for the answer. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. John told us, writing to the church, that if we believe that we, that we are heard, our prayers are heard, then we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of you. So we thank you for the answer. We thank you for our healing. We thank you for your healing mercy that's working in our bodies. The same Holy Spirit, the great Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is quickening our bodies now, and we thank you for it. We thank you, Father, for making healing available to us. We thank you for Jesus paying the price for our poverty and our lack. We thank you, therefore, Father, that all of our needs are met. We thank you, Father, for bringing your word to pass. We declare that our faith is giving substance to the things that we desired, our healing, our material well-being, and the things that we petitioned you for. So we simply thank you for it, Father. We praise your holy name. We magnify you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to pay the price for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father for your plan of redemption that brings us into the fullness of your blessing. We love you, Father, and we thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen.